Hi, and welcome to A Critical Dragon, where I talk about narrative in film, television, and in books. And today I am joined by Ian C. Esselmont, the author of Return of the Crimson Guard. Cameron, how are you doing? Hello, thanks for having me, AP. So today we're, we're going to talk about Return of the Crimson Guard. Um, if I'm right, you wrote this before you wrote Night of Knives, but Night of Knives got published first. Uh, yes, the yeah. original version, the original manuscript. Um, but did it start out as uh, as a film script as well, or was it straight into novelization? Straight into novelization. The, um, the opening of the novel is the original opening uh, with Kyle. Uh, and um, that is among, among the very first pieces written in the world. Uh, and then I showed them to Steve and, uh, yeah. Um, so this is, this is the beginning of the entire Malazan world is actually the, the opening of this book. I believe so. I mean, uh, we can talk to Steve about it, but I think it's one of the first things that he saw and that where we attempted to novelize and, and write it down, uh, from our gaming. Oh, we, we don't want to talk to Steve about that. Like, what's he going to say? He's going to deny everything or, what? you know. Uh, of course, the original is, you know, different. We had to make, I had to make a lot of changes when I did the final version of the novel. But um, Because one of the characters here, uh, Iron Bars. Right. The Steve created Iron Bars for his, in, in his, uh, I forget where he appears first. Uh, uh, I think it's Midnight Tides. Could be. Um, so, although he, he turns up in uh, Return of the Crimson Guard, and obviously Return of the Crimson Guard has Crimson Guard in it, th this, was, this was a character that Steve created in the novels. It wasn't even a game character. It was a, a novel character that he then just basically posted to you, like stuck on a ship and went, there you go. <laughs> yeah, he emailed me. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna make, I'm gonna use some Crimson Guardsmen here in this, and then we talked about it. Yeah. Well, that's very cool because I mean, um, Iron Bars has a a fantastic scene in this where he fight. Now you're gonna correct my my pronunciation on this. Segula. Segula. Fine, Segula. Uh, <laughs> Just count on it happening. It's just... <laughs> For as long as I have known both of you, I don't think I have ever once originally said the proper way of pronouncing almost anyone's name or the race names or anything that between you and Steve, you just, you correct me all the time and I'm just used to it. <laughs> you realize we're just messing with you. <laughs> oh, it's always a joy. Um, <laughs> But when, when Iron Bars and the, the Segula meet, that was uh, Segula. <laughs> um, when when they, they meet on, the, and we have that cultural misunderstanding where someone is trying to translate to, to Iron Bars, no, 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 ju just do this. And you build up the tension so well of Iron Bars, this avoid, someone we know who is incredibly powerful, keeping his eyes down and picking up the weapon and moving along. And he, there's another Segula standing in the way who has their sword out and he just sort of sidles past to get to the one that he's allowed to challenge. And the tension that you build up in that where he slowly raises his eyes up. The Segula looks at him, kind of just does a quick nod, and the fight has already started. And it just goes into that sequence. And I just want to say, like, I really love that, that someone we knew was so powerful to put them into a situation where the assumption would be Iron Bars is just going to absolutely demolish them and to show that it was a real fight. And it elevates the the power and the skill of the uh, Segula. And we worked for Iron Bars. I mean, he was um, 
smart enough, if you will, and, and uh, to, to, to know, to, to cooperate. <laughs> uh, there are other characters who may not have chosen to cooperate. Um, and that was, uh, isn't that a reference that it was uh, Rake? Uh, it was a game that you and Steve ran, or you and Steve were, were gaming, and Anamander Rake ended up on that island. Uh, and you hadn't explained who the Segula were. Oh, oh, oh. I, have, I haven't, I don't think I've talked about that, the, the introduction of the Segula. Um, um, it's, a, it's a side narrative, but it's a great story. I mean, we can... Well, it's not gonna, it's not gonna ruin any future books for you to talk about it now, is it? Um, no, I don't think so. Um, you quite early on, uh, and, and Rake was, um, of course, very powerful and was exploring the, 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 the world in the game and uh, hadn't really uh, found anything that was um, um, a major challenge. And so I told him, well, you're in the, you're in, in the woods on some island, and he sees some kids playing in a stream, <clears throat> capturing fish with their hands, and he notices that they have swords. All these kids have swords. And uh, so he goes down to the stream and they look up and he sees that they're all wearing little black masks uh, and they s surround him. And then one by one, they challenge him and he just bats them aside. Um, and, he's, and then while he's doing that, some adults nearby, they come running over and they're all wearing masks as well, very multicolored masks and they challenge him. And, and so he's, again, he's just sort of pushing them away and, and uh, batting them aside but more and more are gathering and he's surrounded. Uh, and um, they always come at him one at a time from the front. Uh, and the, he has no respite and, you know, and time is passing and he's sort of backing away trying to detach himself from this. But he can't because they're constantly engaging him and more and more arriving uh, with smoother and smoother, clearer masks. Uh, and uh, he finally has to draw his sword, but he don't, in Dragnepair, but at first he uses the, air, the, the, the flat and he's just sort of bashing them and knocking them out and, or butt hitting them. Uh, and, um, but he's starting to take cuts and he's uh, losing, you know, in game, game terms, hit points, strength, and uh, slowly draining from him. And uh, he can see his, own, his health sort of going down and down and down as uh, time is passing and the engagement continues. And the only way to uh, escape would to be to assemble to, to change into his dragon form. But he can't because when he does that, he'll be helpless during that transition and he'll get cut to ribbons. So um, finally he backs away to a cliff uh, and he's facing people now who are, who he's having to like fight to the death almost uh, to defend himself because they're so good that uh, and then he just sort of leaps backwards off of the cliff. And then as he's falling, transcends, transitions <clears throat> into his dragon form and manages to escape. And they're all left standing there looking up at him with their masks. <laughs> and uh, I saw it over the course of the whole evening was this one long running battle. Uh, and he barely escaped alive. Uh, and so that was the introduction of the Segula to, to the world. And it's, I'm just imagining Steve going, I am never going back to that island ever. <laughs> yeah, yes. And that was the uh, invention of the legend of the Black Sword as well. Uh, having met him, they estimated him at around seventh. So that's what they gave him. They gave him that rank. <laughs> well, let's. I'd, I had heard part of that story before, but I, I didn't, I didn't, I hadn't heard all of it. <laughs> yeah, it was time to take him down a notch. So uh, it was, it was, was fun. It, was, was he getting a little bit big for his britches? He was. Rake was getting a little bit c uh, c complacent. <clears throat> um, but no, so uh, obviously uh, Philip Chase and I, had a, a a chat about this because Philip is new to reading the novels of the Malazan Empire, so he's a he's a new reader compared to me, who, who has read them once. 
I've I've gone back I've gone back to bits and pieces. This is the same with uh, with Erickson's novels as well. There are certain sections and scenes that I have read multiple times. There are things that I've dipped into for various academic reasons. But the, it's a different experience than sitting down and reading it cover to cover. And so I really enjoyed rereading it um, to get that that experience again. And now uh, knowing who the characters are, knowing the world and, and understanding all of that adds just so much more to the reading experience because I know the characters, I know the world. I hope so. I hope so, yeah. Um, but uh, one of the things that, that Philip and I didn't quite get to in our conversation, uh, which we had meant to and, and forgot because we were having too much fun, uh, was to, to talk about some of the themes that you were exploring in uh, Return of the Crimson Guard. Um, and one of the, the interesting things that I picked up from the, uh, the initial epigraph and the prologue the the clash between the the two binaries uh light and and darkness or or night uh the leozin and the the andy and this this middle ground between them that obviously in the the initial epigraph uh this representation of the middle ground the the shadow the grayness uh gets torn apart by light and dark which you know metaphorically is obviously the the all the thing about uh Carl Demerland being in in fragments and pieces as part of the world but we we see in this novel all of these binary oppositions being set up initially so the civil war within um the Malazan empire but also the Malazan Empire and the Crimson Guard. Uh, and then with the, uh, the mages, the idea of the, the crippled god against the Malazan world or chaos versus order, you know, th there are all of these sorts of positions that you set out and then you complicate them um, by showing that, yes, from one perspective, you can see two sides, but it's always, as soon as you go into that, there are more sides. So within the Crimson Guard, we see, well, there's Skinner and Kaz loyal to, uh, loyalists. Within the Malazan Empire, there's obviously Malik Rel and Lacine and, and different movements there. So just exploring that, like, I mean, uh, what do you think of my garbled attempt at that? Just fine. I mean, um, uh, everybody's pursuing, you know, what they think is the best interest uh you know not perhaps for themselves or for their uh you know loyalists or whoever they're working with um and there's i hope no real you know classical villain here everybody is just trying to to do what they think is best well malik rel you <laughs> give you give him green teeth steve did i had to, yeah steve did that yeah Oh yeah, blame him because he's not here to defend himself. But you can't trust someone with green teeth when no one else has them. Like he's a human. With, you go, it's kind of just creepy. No, it's just discolored. Uh, um, you know, uh, even he thinks he knows best. So, <laughs> but and again, like Malik Rell, he he comes across all. I wouldn't say sympathetically. But yeah. he certainly yeah. comes across as someone who thinks he knows what's best for the empire. And he doesn't think that that's Lacine. Um, so there's a balance I get, at least in reading him, between his ambition, which is obviously, yes, he wants more power. But I also think that he genuinely believes he's going to be better at the job than Lacine. It's not just about personal ambition for him i think so yes uh definitely um you know, he definitely feels that way uh and um if you look back at you know <clears throat> the, the the model of the, the earlier em empires roman or byzantine or what have you um 
it's the schemers and people who are driven and feel that they can bring a better vision to uh, the ex existing political situation who bring <laughs> all sorts of riot and tumult and over, uh, end up overturning things. And yet you also give Lucine quite a lot more sympathy in your treatment of her than uh, than Erickson ever did. I hope so. Yeah, uh, I see her much more as a tragic figure. I think he does too, but I have been able to spend more time with her, uh, I think. Yeah, um, because we, uh, this is where we actually get to see Lucine fight. <laughs> well, maybe in a few other places as well, but definitely here. Uh... Um, so what, what made you, you pick sort of Lucine never using a weapon. Because she, she fights no. barefoot, bare hands against the avoid. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, we see her in the uh, prequels as well. Uh, and and uh, much of the uh, prowess of the claw come from her, her training. So uh, it's, it's, you know, she's the, the, the uh, um, model if you will for for all of that and that's just that's her technique um was that the the monk D, &D class or were, were you not thinking quite so rigidly well no more martial arts than 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 monk but so yeah i mean if you had to give <laughs> well because it, it's interesting because kiska actually makes that point about lacine saying that her style resembled the the claw, and then she she corrects herself and says, "No, it's more like the claw is the child's mimicry of that advanced style." And you you make that very very explicit in the in the text that the claw really are modelled on on her, her personally. Um, whereas we have uh, Topper in the uh, Imperial Warren makes a point about one of the uh one of the people fighting like a uh, dancer uh and obviously as a talent and it's you're one of his and he regrets having to to attack them yeah they they uh recognize each other's styles uh and uh at least those who are paying attention anyway do uh and um we have um, um, a, you know, it becomes an order, if you will, and uh, and a uh, a power that's being transmitted through uh, training. Yeah. It becomes um, part of the empire. Because obviously, with with Lucine, the the idea of her not using weapons, of being so self controlled, it, it makes her very very lonely. As a as a figure, like we see her fighting the avoid on her own, that she does it in secret. That it's not, it's not. Uh, she's not Dasim with his sword, um, uh, the attendants as well as like the the actual weapon standing on a battlefield. It's sneaking out in disguise to go and do this. So she still puts the em empire first, but not necessarily in like a, an official capacity. That is in keeping and with the whole <clears throat> um, secretive approach that she's bringing to power. It's always hidden. Uh, and people looking on the outside don't appreciate that, you know, and, and fail to see that. Uh, but that's her uh, modus operandi, so to speak. That's how she um, operates. Um, so if you're so sympathetic to her, why, why, why did you let her die? <laughs> well, there's a lot of debate about that. <laughs> yes, uh, I wanted something very shocking um, that uh, people don't see too often in these books, which is where you're being carried along on a trip, and you are expecting to reach a distant final point with a set of characters uh, and I 
decided that we would show, and Steve as well, would show people that no, that's not the trip that you're on here. Uh, and, and so <clears throat> that was one of the big markers for, for, uh, for the reader that, wait a moment, this is, uh, you know, shocking. Uh, and why did that happen? And as Steve did with um, uh, adjunct. Um, Lorne and, Lorn. and Gardens of the Moon. Yeah, it, it, but it is, it's strange because the scene in, in Steve's books is so much of a, um, a distant figure who is always present in terms of the empire, but not a, not a character that you see or interact with. Uh, but her presence is always felt. And then here we finally get, here's Lucine. This We're going to find out about Lucine, and then you kill her. <laughs> it's my uh, George R. R. Martin moment, perhaps. <laughs> um, but the the theme of betrayal and treachery in this is... Again, it, it's not straightforward. It's not that, you know, betrayal happens. It, we see it from so many different angles of so many different facets of it. Um, can, can you talk through a little bit about that? Uh, because I find it fascinating. Hmm. Well, <clears throat> I'm not sure I can talk through that um, as a, a separate uh, facet from say the return aspect okay and, and homecoming and and the um that frisian of vision where you were expecting something but it's not what you see uh and and so there's all of these these disjunctions uh between all of those goals well okay so thinking in terms of return let's uh, break it down and we'll, we'll try and break it down into a couple of the specific story elements, uh, some of the, the plot threads. So if we think of the, the guard themselves, you know, Return of the Crimson Guard, it's, it's all in the title. Um, it, start us off on this one. Yeah, well, it, this is a theme in, in um, Steve's, and it's in the whole world, of course, that um, in, in the, the goal of returning, what they're trying to do is go back into the past, which is a backward step. And you, you, that really can't happen. You can, it's impossible. You can't go back, right? As as they say, uh, and and that's what we find. And what's what? That's what the the guard discovers when when uh, they come back. Uh, not only has time moved on. Not only has the political situation and and culture changed. And they've been left behind. Um, and they're not even welcome anymore. Um, and they find that they have changed also. And so they can't return because they're different. Now they weren't, they aren't no longer what they used to be when they left. So it's a failure and on, on both sides. And so the return is impossible. Uh, and same for the old guard who want to bring back the prior hierarchy of Kellenbe, uh, where And that can't happen as well because the culture of the empire the, has moved on. So that's a failed effort. Uh, and then the same again and again on, on, on so many sides, uh, a, a homecoming that is bittersweet because you, the home, it's, you don't recognize it anymore and they don't recognize you. And it's... Because you even quite explicitly have, is it Gehel or Ge uh, the air, the air Jill. of, oh, Jill. Um, where, trying to, to re-establish that, to return her to par, and it's absolutely failed because there's no place for that anymore. That, that can't happen. You cannot re-establish an order that died out generations ago. Yeah, the old Italian um, <clears throat> dynasty, yes, yeah. Um, but I think one of the, the aspects of this then that interested me a lot was Skinner and Shimmer. So Shimmer... Uh, of the, much more morally complex uh, than than I think 
I was kind of expecting because I I had this image in my head of Shimmer actually being quite noble. And when we see her in the book, she she does come across as one of the the good guys uh, who is on the side of the Crimson Guard, like she's in the void. But uh, whereas Skinner just comes across as one of the bad guys and he's on the side of the Crimson Guard. So you, you set up this nice dichotomy between the two of them. But what they are returning to, what they, the, the order they seem to be trying to reestablish, Skinner and Shimmer have entirely different conceptions of what that should be. Um, we see what um, Skinner has in mind in Blood and Bones, for example. Um, it's sort of an, an ex we see that playing out there. Um, and Shimmer, yes, I mean, I, I hope that we see that she's, you know, of course, racked by doubt and uh, because she sees any sort of disloyalty uh, as a betrayal of Kaz um, and, he, and, and yet she's driven by exigency to, to do the things that she has to do to ensure the survival of, of uh, her company. Because one of the, the earliest scenes with her um, I think it's in, in chapter two, is when they have defeated these people, got all the slaves, they've killed the slavers and they've got all of these slaves. And it's like, right, Shimmer comes down. Anyone who wants to join up, you're, you're free to join up if you're, you're healthy and able. So these slaves come out and they go, oh, great. And as they are brought away, all of the, the older or weaker ones, Shimmer's like, right, put them back in chains and go and sell them because we need the money. And that... The, the roller coaster of seeing her as, you know, this liberator, which, you know, we associate good, honorable, um, uh, not necessarily a paladin, but, you know, one of the good guys. And then as soon as the others are out of sight, it's like, no, put them back in chains. We need the cold, hard cash. Like, we have to keep, we're a mercenary company. I hope so, uh, that... This is an example where, you know, in some fantasy series, you might have that straightforward move where we have the hero uh, making, you know, the, the moral, or what we would see as moral choice. Uh, but then again, in our world, um, um, we also have this sort of feet on the ground, real politic uh, that hard choices have to be made uh, and even ex inexcusable ones, perhaps. Uh, but uh, but we want to show the complexity of uh, of that situation because then when we see her in contrast to Skinner, and of course Skinner's her old commander, and when Skinner says that Kyle had killed, um, oh I've forgotten his name. They who's this? Was it Stoop? I'm yeah. Not um and skinner says oh no no uh kyle did that and she immediately believes skinner and skinner and kyle have sort of suborned the brethren and have fooled the brethren as well and find a way to to lie to them and, and hide things from them but shimmer's absolute faith in her old commander even when he is standing there and has a palpable aura of horror attached to him um but she sees him almost with nostalgic eyes of no that's my old commander i you know this is this is how hierarchy works and immediately blames kyle when anyone with a modicum of logic would go no hang on a sec hide the little new kid go anywhere <laughs> near anyone and and do any damage that that doesn't make any sense <clears throat> yeah, I mean, she has her uh, flaws as well. I mean, she, at that point in time, chooses uh, the established order and hierarchy over uh, any quandary. Right? And, and so we all make those choices and, and we can change. Uh, at least the hope for the, in, in the book and the world is that, you know, you have to think about change. Um, and if you refuse it, if you try and stay frozen, um, and that's the, just the sort of the neg negative side of return, uh, then you're going to fail because everything else is moving on. Uh, 
So you would say instead of being frozen, you should just let it go. <laughs> well, don't try to bring back the past. Let's say <laughs> the past is the past. Um, I'm sorry, I couldn't resist that one. Yeah, um, right. Let it go. Let it go. Uh, <laughs> I now, I now have a bizarre image of some jagged dancing. <laughs> With a snowman. Uh, oh, dear. Um, well, since we're at this point of, um, with Kyle, um, naming, the naming um, <clears throat> conventions and such. Um, and I know that you and... Um, Philip? Philip uh, spoke about this in uh already but um i would like to just sort of throw my two cents in and uh, i know that people have talked about that name and uh, choice and, and sort of it's some um, real world roots and been un unhappy with with that uh and so and i think you guys did a great job talking about that uh i would just add to that um that you know the the um picking on that sort of mystifies me in, in some ways, uh, especially when you think about uh, another very successful series, uh, which had a character who was very prominent, whose last name was Snow, and whose first name I think was a very common real world name. Um, I think it might've been John. Uh, and, you know, I know a few Johns and I, and so really? to, yeah, to, so to jump on, you know, and say you can't do that. Well, you know, <laughs> just, I think you'll find it very common through. Um, and yeah, and it it it's a bizarre thing that individual readers and I I assume that you and I both do this for for different things as well. But sometimes there will be one little tiny thing, and it's it, it's insignificant in the grand scheme of things but it'll snag your eye and it'll worm its way in there like a bit of grit. And it just, every single time you just go, why? And you know, if you're able to take that step back from it and go, hang on a sec, let me, let me think about this. Is it that really big of a deal? No, of course not. It's not a big deal. But until you, you learn how to take that step back to go, uh, no, this, this is absolutely fine. It, it can be difficult as a reader. People do have their fixations. Uh, I remember that some of, uh, you know, the, the, the language can be addressed as well. You know, um, like in Knives early on, I'm sorry, this is a digression. Um, I talked about <clears throat> um, Malaz as a sea power. And the term for that is Greek is thalassocracy. <laughs> thalassocracy. Uh, and um, put that in there and people were um, snagged on that as well. And so. Or um, I, I think one of the ones that, that Erickson has is he referred to an Achilles tendon. And you go, well, the, at some point you have to realize that he, he, the books have to exist in a form that we can read in this world. <laughs> yes. And uh, particularly writing in English, where English is made up of the bastard love children of Latin, um, the old Germanic languages, uh, some Celtic languages, and then borrowings from modern English, borrowings from everywhere. And it, French. It's you have you have Greek Greek rooted words, Latin rooted words, Norman French. Uh, modern French, uh, Old German, Anglo-Saxon, uh, Norse, all of these different variants of various languages over a huge time frame blended together and you go, well, yes, I think they should have all been like Tolkien and completely invented languages for everyone. <laughs> that would have been uh, <laughs> quite the challenge. And the readers would have to learn those languages. Uh, well, each, reader, each reader individually would have to learn all those languages in order to read the book. But it, it's amazing because, <laughs> well, well, fantasy literature in general, like all, all fantasy books do this, that there's a negotiation between the, the fantasy world and the real world. 
and it, it all falls on a scale, but there is an assumption that the language that they are speaking is the language the text is, pr is printed in. So if you're reading the German version of Return of the Crimson Guard, um, obviously everyone's speaking in German and it is written in German. So the language of the Malazan world is German, but that's obviously not true. Um, it, it's not English either. It's not Spanish. It's not French. It's not Portuguese. It's not Polish. Mm -hmm. It's not Afrikaans. I actually, well, I don't know if it's been translated into Afrikaans. Well, no, but, but yes, we all we all have to set. You have to stand back and just understand that it's all uh, merely a convention. Uh, for you know, for expediency's sake, we do this, and and let's just sort of move on. Uh, yeah, and yeah, um, but of course, everyone has their, as you said, the little little ticks that. Uh, they, although I will say this, I I I'm going to ban apostrophes from certain fantasy authors keyboards when it comes to naming <laughs> the the apostrophe is a scourge upon fantasy names i've seen some pretty long names yeah that's <laughs> prince <laughs> kaz we have, we have a few box apostrophes no but hang a sec prince kaz apostrophe in his bloody name did he need an apostrophe no and it's it's kaz and his surname has a bloody apostrophe as well. Well, when we, get to, when we get to the sale, uh, that's explained. <laughs> <laughs> Although, actually, I, I did, uh, I do have to admit that uh, you and and Erickson did come up with an excellent reason for why that apostrophe appears in certain places. It was very well done. Um, but fantasy is, is so bizarre because things that you get away with in mimetic writing, uh, you're just not allowed to do in fantasy. Um, like you have to come up with, well, all of these people are from this one culture. Uh, shouldn't they all have similar sounding names? And it's go and look in your local high school and ask for like a roster of first names to see, it, do, does everyone have a similar sounding name? But for some reason, that gets applied to fantasy, that there's an expectation that there is a cultural naming convention that you have to adhere to. But if it's a mimetic work, if it's a, a modern literary work, no, because, oh, yeah, well, of course, everyone has diverse names. Yeah, some cultures uh, do insist on. I mean, when we were, uh, of course, living in Thailand, there was a, um, a lot of very similar last names, and that's the same for North, uh, the Korea as well, and that's because it's a recent invention, <laughs> you know, and they only had a list of like maybe a few names that they were allowed to choose from, you know, like Lee or Kim, et cetera. And so that's why you have such similar names in certain cultures. They say that's one explanation for that. Uh, and then cultural traditions as well. Uh, and, and then the, the assumption of lack of travel and lack of mixing uh, culturally. Uh, but which is actually less true than than we than I think we we think. Well, I mean, we we have records that the the Vikings were raiding all the way down into Byzantium. We have we have records of uh, uh, even in the in the Roman period of people of all different races being living in Rome and Roman centurions like wandering around all over Africa. Like there was a <clears throat> <laughs> Sorry, excuse me. I th I, the ancient world had significantly more travel and integration than I think a lot of us believe. And and obviously, yeah. like you, you I and so. even in, in medieval times, we have uh, religious pilgrimages. Uh, lots and lots of people went on religious pilgrimages to the Holy Land, and uh, and uh, so you you have a lot more uh, travel and trade. Lots more trade going on in the economics in, in necessitated that uh so i think that that was more of a feature of this world of, of that world than than we are uh, used to to allowing well I, and i think it's because a lot of pop uh renditions of history so when we see historical dramas you know it's almost always pseudo-european it's almost always very very white and there seems to be a reticence to acknowledge 
the diversity of race uh, and ethnicity that was present across the whole of Europe. That there, there seems to be this idea of no, no, no. Medieval Europe was was almost predominantly white, but there was a huge, uh... <clears throat> much greater uh, Jewish population, uh, and also. Um, migrants and people who were coming from the east from the steppe. I mean, there's, there's, um, it was much more mixed. Uh, Hungary, of course, being. Uh, um, but in, okay, so we've gone afield. And so travel, um, if you want to travel in these, these times, these medieval classical fantasy worlds, um, you need ships. And so our culture is, um, you know, air travel. We think of travel by airplane, but in the ships were the way to travel. That's why I think uh, people are seeing all these ships in in my uh, particular versions of, of things. I always like to show the means of travel, and um, for the preponderance of of our experience, that has meant um, using vessels you know, when they were available. Uh, it's like a far better way to travel than overland. So. <laughs> well, I, I, unless they're sea monsters, you know. <laughs> well, there's a few, but not as many as there are people trying to rob you on, on, the, on the mainland. <laughs> um, but uh, actually, I'm thinking about, you know, with the return of the Crimson Guard. Um, so you obviously, they had a diaspora. And you know they're all trying to to coalesce to converge, um, but we we also see a lot of the old guard who had been presumed dead, who had drowned, who had disappeared. The, there's a convergence of them as well. So it's almost like the, the gathering of the guard is leading to the gathering of uh, the old guard as well. So um, maybe a, a bad coincidence. <laughs> so I don't... Uh, terrible, terrible coincidence that uh, this should be happening at the same time. I guess. Well, uh, and again, uh, yeah, we, the fantasy we, novel. So. But <laughs> narrative contrivance is again one of those things that you have to negotiate in fiction. But what's interesting about this, I, I think, for me, is that both both you and Erickson had come up with that idea of no, the world has convergences that we have gods and deities who are manipulating things who are nudging people in certain directions to create ripple effects that um, when power is unveiled in one area, it is acting as a natural lodestone to other power. And I think you make that point quite explicitly with Patron in this novel. Um, yeah, well, I've talked about that. Um, it's not even necessarily the, uh, a, a, an actor, but just the very fact of uh, power. Uh, itself who draws just uh, as the old you you can't have that in a vacuum you know it just it just doesn't happen uh, and and so uh, we we see that happening and that um, with the rise of Kellenbed himself causing that to happen because other forces arise in response to that so. um, and I, I don't know if you, you saw the, the talk that Philip and I did on my channel where we were actually discussing spoilers, but Philip got me to admit that I disliked Tayshran less because of this novel. I, I didn't go as far as saying I liked him, but I disliked him less. Well, we see him first, uh, well, readers, if they're reading uh, in, in order of publication, they see him first in gardens. And uh, he's seen from the outside. He's seen from um, Tattersale's point of view, I think. Uh, and he comes across very badly in, in, in her view. She dislikes him uh, intensely. And so we see him in very bad light, so to speak. Um, and his actions are, are um, very misguided and, and um, reprehensible in, in, in that novel. So, yeah, it's a bad opening for him. That's... <laughs> <laughs> it, it, there were there were two points I wanted to make about this. Number one was this illustrates how important the the first impressions or the the early setting up of a character is within any mm -hmm. story or any narrative framework. 
uh, because it is very, very difficult to change a reader's mind once they have made up their mind about a character. This is how I feel about this character. They will always, they will have that mindset. So it becomes very difficult to change their mind. But that leads me to my second point, which is one of the things that uh, both you and Erickson do that uh, not amazes me, but I'm impressed by is you make me change my mind about certain characters that characters that I want to loathe or hate. I start to feel sympathy for, or I start to understand better, or I come to an understanding and go, I've misjudged them. And it's rare to see that in fantasy novels. That's like, yeah. Yeah, it's really, um, I think that's a great challenge, so to speak, to, to ask yourself, can I put myself into, you know, through empathy and through into someone else's, you know, subject position and portray it in an accurate and fair way? I mean, that is, a, that's a real challenge for a writer. Uh, and uh, to be, and if it's, you know, I can't say if it succeeds or not, but uh, we, we are always, I think, we're always trying to, uh, bring up un undredge a, uh, a subject position that has been glossed over or hasn't been given in uh, uh, attention. We sort of always look for those and try to bring them up. Um, well, one of the, one of the questions I wanted to ask you, uh, was actually, it was, it was about the old guard in that you, you introduce talk the elder. And we, we actually get to spend some time with him and we get to like him. Can you please explain yourself, young man, as to why you made me like this character and then unceremoniously just kill him? Oh, another one. <laughs> There's quite a few, aren't there? <laughs> yeah. Oh, dear. Well, some had to go. We had to have that. Um, the, the, you know, you, we, we can't just carry along with everybody uh, in, in a sort of picaresque adventure without change and without any sort of transformation. Um, so sorry um, that he was one of the ones who had to go. <laughs> I just imagine like in your head, you've lined them all up and you're like, you I like, yeah, yeah you're going to be useful. Talk. Sorry, my friend. It's been fun. Give me a hug right now. And off you go. <laughs> uh, no, no, no planning. It just comes out of the, the plot and the moment. Because that that moment of betrayal actually is is a real gut punch. Um, because we built up a an affection for talk, but also the, the hints of legend about him. And to be betrayed like that, which is going to cost the battle like that that was that was the big moment in the battle that could have completely changed the fate of everyone and then for talk to ride after them and just be unceremoniously killed it it wasn't it wasn't like in the the greek myths with the the great and glorious duel uh, like on the battlefield of meeting your your opponent and the better man won this this was just he was executed that's just the story that's those are just stories that's not really how it happened. Um, <clears throat> yeah, it had to be something shocking and 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 um, unforeseen. Otherwise, he would have seen it. So um, that you know, the, the reader not only can the reader you know, not shouldn't be seeing, uh, but the character shouldn't because that you know wouldn't be realistic. Uh, so I, I hope that it was seen as something that made sense from the point of view of, you know, the, the shaman and the tribal elders uh, and it made sense to them. So, um, um, because, well, I mean, and one of the, the themes I know that you've talked, uh, you've talked about before is th this idea of having a look at religion and, and faith and how these religions and faiths build up over time and, and how they are, uh, not necessarily subverted, but uh, get used to justify certain positions of power. Uh, they, 
and you're, you're not making a qualitative or an evaluative judgment. You're exploring the issue more than anything else. Um, because the worship of Rolandras is, it, it's so twisted. Um, like, how did coming up with that, like, what, why? <laughs> power. I mean, some people are looking for power and they, they saw it there and they saw a way to try and uh, uh, leash it and you know, transform it and use it for their own purposes. Uh, misguided perhaps, but uh, still it's, uh, these are individuals who were just searching for power. Um, because we see that with obviously like Malik Rell losing his religious power uh, in this book, because obviously Mail has now broken free of, of Malik's power. Finally, um, we, you know, the, the very last um, vestiges of any sort of control that, that he might have or claim to have uh, is, is uh, we see that's the end of it there. Um, so he, but it's interesting because he sort of then ends as a religious or quasi-religious figure and becomes entirely secular in his moment of ascending to the head of an empire. So you actually have a nice transition from he loses his religious power, but gains the secular power over the state. There's, <clears throat> well, I have to be careful at this point in time. I have to be careful because um, he is being uh, he's featured in uh, my current novel that I'm working on, and we're going to be seeing uh, more of that uh, in the future. So <laughs> something to look forward to, I hope. <laughs> yeah, it, I'm looking forward to it. Um, so a couple more, just a, a general points here. In the prologue, Denneth, the child of earth, uh, the child of the earth, and obviously refers to mother earth or, uh, who, you know, the, the Gaia figure that we, we assume is burn, but he's made of rock. Who, who is he? Are we not animated clay ourselves? I mean... But see, here's the thing. In the initial epigraph, it is told from the compendium primal, and you have that, that wonderful, overblown, metaphorical, archaic uh, description of things. But then in the prologue, it moves into, yes, an older form of narrative, but it is almost purporting to be a uh, version of the events. Um, and so with all of the different races that we've met, I, I just was curious about Denneth. <laughs> More of an entity, I would say, and a witness, uh, one of our witnesses, and uh, not necessarily a, um, member of a larger race but a, a, a creation an entity uh but you know you, the um children of the earth these the race that steve and i have were are sort of calling giants or delo men or delakai uh you know they had to have a progenitor perhaps at some point in time so uh these these um uh religious uh creation myths are uh up up for debate and uh yeah, and but again, that's that was one of the things that I loved about the the prologue is that, and and Erickson does it as well that going into these far past settings, but the language typically of the narrative in in those fragments or in the epigraphs of these prologues actually changes to reflect the fact that this is, this is not reportage, this is a story within a story. It is. Uh, it is the great myth. It's the earth being made out of a giant ball of dung by a dung beetle. It's all of these sorts of things. That's a lot of fun. And I, I, I think Steve enjoys it too. It's a lot of fun doing those. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's, you don't get a chance very often now to use that kind of language, given modern narrative is, you know, everything has to be pared down. Everything has to be very, very clean and transparent. And we lose a lot of, I think, the flavor 
of language in an effort yeah. to to clean it yeah that's a challenge for our genre because uh that's one of the things i would like to spend more time on i would like to be able to as an author luxuriate more in that uh, and and really have fun uh with the language but i don't know how much of a readership you 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 could expect <laughs> there will always be some of course but it's the hard to find that knife edge medium that happy mean between the two and you know i i had recently done a video jokingly about the use of the word ochre in the malazan book of the fallen because it was one of those words that although when you think about it in context does not occur a lot for a lot of people it was a strange word and yet <laughs> the the comments i was getting from other people were but this is really this is a really common word and i'm going well i know that <laughs> but what we <laughs> one of the things that we have in in fantasy is well number one we have uh, fantasy throws in fantasy terms made up terms uh, strange terms that you know don't typically appear on your quarterly tax return or uh on a news story ah yes two necromancers were uh galloping down a widening gar you know fantasy encourages a, a a type of prose that deviates from the norm and the danger of that then is because everything else is so paired back in terms of of narrative in other genres that it appears purple or um, overly embellished. Artificial. Mm. Um, whereas, you know, you, you look back, look at Gothic, uh, the Gothic genre. You, you look at um, 18th, 19th century literature, wonderful, expressive, and very diverse vocabularies being found in standard texts. But now we've we seem to have shrunk our vocabulary, particularly in English language narratives, to to pare it down to almost like a minimalist standard. It might be that um, that's a place for for you know for our genre, perhaps that, that maybe that's our new home is where uh, we're willing to um, luxuriate more in in uh, language and explore its. Um, you know, darker corners uh, and, and and play with them. Uh, that's um, I'm not staking out any ground. I'm just saying that uh, it maybe that's where there's more patience for it. I I because um, I know certainly in other genres, detective or police procedural, it's just a vehicle to get you from A to B. I mean, the whole point is just to travel from point A to point B and get that do that as quickly as possible. Uh, but um, and maybe that's why in fantasy in, you have these door stopping novels because we're will, more willing to s take side journeys and, and uh, digressions and play with things um, maybe a bit more, uh, I'd hope. Yeah, it's, um, I mean, it's, it's something that is going to happen. Like narrative goes through phases, we get trends arise and fall we get styles arise and fall uh these things just happen over time it's just it's just a very curious one because fantasy it, it seems almost the perfect genre to actually explore and play with language uh, it and, and science fiction and when i was a teenager uh fantasy and science fiction expanded my vocabulary so significantly because i was encountering um terms and, and words and, and concepts that you were finding in history books or archaeology or in mythology from different cultures and everything about it just sort of expanded your appreciation of how to tell stories and the texture of language well we can't i mean um steve and i are doing our part in in, in enjoying ourselves like we're having fun like that's really the main thing we're, 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 what we're doing is what we find enjoyable and not only to write, but to read, uh, you know, I, 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 that's what I really enjoy as a reader. Um, but shout out here. If you, if you are uh, really interested in this, um, 
you just have to go pick up Stephen R. Donaldson's Lord Fowl's Bane. And uh, that's where you should go for uh, extraordinary language play. That's... Um, and, like, I was about to say, hang on a sec. Stay right there. I'm not going to go anywhere else. But it's... <laughs> I'm sorry, you'll just edit this out. It's... No, 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 but hang on. But I actually, I got the, the omnibus edition because I kept losing copies. Oh. Uh, and it's harder to lose this copy because it's eh, quite witty. Because it's even more gigantic. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, Don, Donaldson's writing, uh, his, his use of language is, is beautiful. Uh, the, another author who, in a totally different way, Guy Gavriel K, the lyricism of, of K's writing. Um, and it's, again, the variety of stories being told, the variety of language being used. It, it, it's such a strength in, in the genre. And it seems yeah, a shame all, that yeah. we're moving away. So, yeah, it's all good. And I don't know if we are moving away. I think it's, commercialization is always pressuring you to, to move away from that. It's true. Uh, but uh, and I think we're, we're sticking to our guns. Uh, a fair bit well but again and it's always going to be that um the tug between true to your vision but keeping a roof over your head and food <laughs> <laughs> uh you know you yeah. you might have your ideals shimmer but at the end of the day you're still going to need to sell those slaves to to keep everyone else fed that's right. That's that's the, the the cruel choices that we face. And uh... Um, well, and on that note, uh, why don't we we call it here for for the evening, Cam? Thank you so much uh, for coming by to talk to me. I really do appreciate it. Well, no, thank you. Thank you for having me, and and thanks for um, the opportunity. It's this is great. Um, so all that remains for me to say is thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed yourselves uh, as much as I have, uh, and I will see you in the next video.